This is Mead McLean with AUSquared.com. Uh, this interview with Man Bartlett is the cut down version. Uh, it's about 40 minutes of, uh, uh, of highlights from the um, two hour version. I just kind of took the best sections and, uh, and cut them together. So um, you'll find that Man Bartlett's work is, uh, is very timely and pointed. And I think you'll find him uh, articulate and interesting. So enjoy. I want to talk like specifically about some of the some of the work that was on your uh, on your website and stuff. Um, I just finished reading uh, the image by Daniel Boyston, um, which is uh, sort of about about pseudo culture in general and pseudo society and. Uh, and it was written in the, I think in the late sixties, okay, so it was yeah. kind of, uh, or maybe 1961 even. Um, so it was kind of, uh, prophetic in terms of, um, in terms of like pinning down American culture. And, uh, and I thought, I thought your collages kind of had a lot to do with that. Um, that whole idea, a, because they're sort of from that era you know, the sort of like 1950s, uh, you know, housewife yeah. imagery and, and yeah, the suitcases yeah. and, and old technology. And, uh, and I thought, you know, it was, it's interesting to, for me to think about like the idea of, of like Panopticon, like coming out at about that time and being written about, and now it's just become like completely mundane, you know, cell phone yeah. cameras, you know. And we, yeah. and we do it voluntarily. And I thought that that is like pretty much like, like right at the core of, of a lot of those, uh, a lot of those collages. Yeah. I, you know, I, it's funny about that whole body of work because I happen to be in a place called materials for the arts, which is this great, um, I guess it's an organization in Long Island city in, in New York. And, um, if you're part of an organization or you're connected to an organization, you can um, basically shop for free. And so people donate materials, they donate materials for the arts um, to, this, to this place. And so I found a stack of these magazines, there were 10 of them, all the same magazine. And it was from that era. Yeah. And I didn't know what I was going to do with them for like, man, for months they just sat in my studio. And in that particular time period, you know, I associate with, you know, a, almost an older generation's interpretation of that generation. So yeah. I feel like it was my grandfather's generation and, you know, my grandmother's and my, you know, my parents then had the interpretation of that time period that they, you know, do and did. And then I'm having this almost like twice removed experience yeah. of it. And sort of through that lens is how I've kind of been thinking about them. And like even recently I started calling them like faux retro. It's like they're not really yeah. retro. It's like removed from that, but thinking about particularly, not just the technology, but like coming out of the war and um, what was going on in, in the American psyche and what, what, like, what was going through people's heads, I mean, you know, and, and how that led to sort of travel and thinking about um, literally how much travel was happening during that period. And that, you know, which is why there were so yeah. many suitcases being developed. And then like how that all links into kind of the industrial complex and yeah. like the manufacturing in this of country course. and how that like very brief window of time was so like um, productive. You know? like, yeah. So much stuff was made. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's true. Yeah. That was, kind of, so, like, that yeah, was kind, kind of the high point of that. And, and that was like the first time that, that travel had like fully gone middle class and then yeah. there was the infrastructure too it's you know they weren't developing new backpacks you know yeah they're developing yeah, yeah. suitcases meant to be carried you know short distances or carried yeah. by someone else entirely yeah. you know yeah, that. Yeah. and that was like really when you know flight caught on and travel agencies had already been established for a while yeah you know cruises things like that were really taken off and there was a healthy middle class i mean that's something yeah. that i'm that i've been thinking a lot about I remember seeing one time that you were uh, that you were negotiating uh, the price of a circle drawing like over Twitter. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, that's a cool thing to see because you know usually that's that's like very much a, a closed door thing. You know, very private. Yeah. yeah, people don't talk about that stuff, and and that's why I wanted to do it. And you know, and and that you know came out of a series of events that 
you know, willing parties and people that were, you know, willing to sort of do that. And, and, you know, part of the issue with, you know, I can be willing to be, hey, I'm going to have everything out in the open, but the reality is that m most collectors aren't, you know, that yeah. willing and they're not that game to have that sort of exposure. Um, and I think it's a generational thing, but it's also just people don't trust it. And, um, yeah. so that can complicate it, but, you know, so it's really exciting when that, when that sort of thing can happen. And sure enough, yeah, it was like totally done transparently. And, um, I'm actually still working on that drawing. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's such a huge commission. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah, yeah. and, like and I, you know, I did that project endeavor. where, sorry, what's that? It looked like it was going to be a huge endeavor. Yeah, giant piece of paper, tiny circles. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and I love it. I mean, I've been doing those drawings since 2006, and so I really, they're to me, they're an important part of my practice. And they don't, you know, they're quiet, and most people don't care about them, which is great because they don't, you know, they're not in any yeah. space that that most people are looking at. But to yeah. me, they round out a practice that's important for me that I maintain these kind of different worlds that I operate in. And, one of them is just standing in front of a drawing for however many hours and, yeah. and just working on it, you know. And then the other one is like the frenetic, like in front of the computer yeah. and, and that sort of, and they balance each other out, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was thinking about that, you know, those circle drawings in terms of like time and technology. And, and that's kind of a, that's kind of a big thing to, for most artists, I think, is to get away from like technological sorts of time. Yeah. You know, to be able to spend time just like, you know, either doing something repetitive or just thinking and sitting or, or whatever it is. Um, yeah. The dishes are really great for that. I love doing the dishes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's that same sort of action. It sounds ridiculous, but you know, I, um, I don't know. There's something about, and I think it's because of the complexity of all the information that we have access to and the way that I process, uh, it, it, things that I'm seeing or thinking about is sometimes incredibly overwhelming. Like, yeah. and I don't, I mean, probably a lot of people have that happening, but I don't, I can't always filter what's coming in. And so it's yeah. like information, information, information. And so when I'm online, yeah. it's like everything, everything, everything. And it's like going in yeah. and like flying around in there. And I'm like, <laughs> it's sort of having fun with it, but it's also freaking me out. Yeah. You know? And, um, and sometimes that's cool. I can run with it. And other times I'm like, ha ah, ha get me out of here. And so the yeah. circles help, but then also just literally like, doing one thing, you know, like the dishes is so like disproportionately relaxing <laughs> yeah. because it's just like my, I'm sort of moving, but I'm also like, you know, yeah. so, and it works out great because my fiance is a great cook. So like she cooks and I do the dishes and it's like, yeah. it's perfect, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, but it is but at the yeah, same I understand time. What like, you mean. Yeah. I understand what you mean. Cause like, I just, um, I just started taking uh, Kung Fu classes like yeah, in October okay. and it yeah. trains your awareness to sort of like spread outwards Yeah, yeah and be yeah. totally sort of consumed in, in your world. And, yeah. and then you go, you know, I go out into like public places, coffee shops, and I, and it's very tough to not hear every conversation all at once. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that's sort of like, I, I don't think it's an awareness that most people ever really you know, necessarily get a glimpse of. Yeah. Nine out of 10 people aren't, uh, just aren't aware. I mean, which is okay. I don't, I don't judge. Yeah, no. I don't judge that, but it's, but that's also part of my job. I mean, I feel yeah. like as an artist is to be aware. So it's like, it's my job. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like, and it's also how I'm wired, but um, for better or worse, you know. But, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's always interesting to me to hear sort of like some of the economic behind the scenes of, of art, you know, because there are some there. It's starting to get out now. There's there's that art slash workbook. And uh, I mean, seven days in the art world maybe isn't like the right book to accurately describe seven days in the art world for the middle of the road artist. But yeah, or for least, yeah. Yeah, but it's still a good entry point. For yeah, sure. yeah. So it's, it's yeah. a it's a start, and I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, I don't know if you saw the or um, but the Occupy Man project, which it, that lasted for a year, and that was a. Um, uh, I publicly disclose all of my finances, uh, all my income yeah. and expenses, in a Twitter account, and uh, and then in a Google document that anyone could access. So that was like, 
like the extreme of sort of accountability in my own personal yeah. finances, but also as like what it, you know, what it takes or how, where my money comes from. And, yeah. uh, and that's something that I think about a lot too, particularly yeah. that again, not a lot of artists are willing to talk about the ones that are selling aren't always so quick to tell you who their collectors are because a lot of times their money, those collectors got their money in really not so great ways. Yeah. And you know, so. And and as, and as artists, we don't really have the luxury of asking too many questions. Yeah, exactly. And, and part of what, you know, I wanted to do, even if I, you know, I didn't want to disclose buyers information, um, you know, in that document, but at least it, it holds me accountable that I see that number, you know, and where that, and luckily, you know, the, the oil oligarchs weren't buying a lot of my collages in, in yeah. 2011, but, or 12, but, um, but yeah, it's something that I, that I think about a lot. And, um, and again, it's as much for me, like being a process oriented person, like I like to understand how these things work, but then I just like to share. I, I think it's important that like, yeah, you know, it's not, and this actually also came out of hashtag class. And I remember like on a very, and I think I talked about this somewhere before, but you know, there, we, I was in one of the sessions one day and, uh, and I think Ed, uh, was talking about, um, how much it costs to run the gallery and what their expenses are. And I can't remember how it came up, but basically I just started writing out my expenses and like on the board and just like laid them out. And I, and it was sort of like terrifying to realize how little, like my expenses are, but then how little my income was, but it was also really liberating at the same time. Yeah. And I looked around the room and it's like, whoa, people are like, you can't do that. Like, that's not okay. You know, and it's, it really is talking about money in that way is such a taboo. And yeah. you know, we have so many issues. It's like sex in America. Like we're so messed up about yeah. it um, sure. that we can't have healthy conversations about it. Yeah. Um, and it's like money is... I mean, money management, it's like, it's always, you know, get rich quickly or, you know, stumble upon your million dollar idea and develop it, that kind of thing. But really yeah. like the long term, you know, wealth is, is a matter of doing like boring stuff, yeah. like yeah, yeah. cut your expenses, like I put know. away a teeny bit. Yeah. You know, and the day to day sort of maintenance of things. And I mean, yeah. you know, I'll be very clear. I'm still terrible at managing my money. Like I have so yeah. little of it that not that hard, but like, yeah. You know, that is still very much like, you know, something that I'm an ongoing project in the, in the yeah, life right. of man, you know? I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. But, but again, like, I think the important thing for me has always been to not treat it like I'm a victim and to just be very, like, again, transparent and upfront about what that, you know, what that is and the relationship to the art. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, most importantly now, this pardon me, in this particular phase is looking at like, okay, transitioning from being a full-time artist to, you know, working part-time to supplement the income. What does that look like? And yeah. um, so I don't know, but yeah, I think, I think I hope that, you know, moving forward, more artists are willing to talk about that aspect and more artists that are like critically engaged, that are critically um, minded and willing to participate in the contemporary art world. And part of what I see is people that get so disillusioned or, you know, bitter or whatever that, however that might manifest itself that leave the art world because they're like, this is crazy. Um, or on the other side, end of the spectrum, you have people, you know, the artists that quote unquote make it. And then, you know, they're, they're folded into the system so that, you know, they're much less likely to be critical or to, to speak out while still being a member of the sort of team, whatever that really means, but to be part of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I really, I really loved um, reading like Damien Hirst's like interview book. It's like several hundred pages of interviews done over like twenty years or something. Oh like wow! That. And uh, and I mean, it's hard to think of him like having to work, you know, a construction job and live in a hovel. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there was a point where where he was, and and I think one of the one of the things he said was like at the times when I couldn't afford to make art, I would just like do a drawing of it, plan it out and shelve it for later and, and come back to it when, when the money rolled in. Yeah, and, totally. You know, that's been like my favorite working piece of advice, you know, just yeah, yeah, compile yeah. ideas. And then when you're well, ready, you can just, you know, it's funny. Cause I was just, uh, I, the other day, well, a while ago, actually I had this idea for a neon. I've never worked in neon before, but yeah. I always like, I like wordplay and having fun with stuff like that. And I was thinking about one where it just says no show and the no is blinking on and off. So the joke is that like, 
it's an, a gallery show that's a no show. So it sort of works on those layers like that. So it's an exhibition, but it sort of doesn't exist or the artist isn't there. And, um, and, and so like I wrote it in my journal and ended up making it into this, uh, like by chance into a video that I was doing for Vine. But then I was like, well, I can make uh, a poor man's neon, which is an animated GIF. So I ended up making a GIF out of this and then just posting it to my Tumblr and like getting the idea out there and just posting the content. And I think that's one of the amazing things about, you know, the access that we have to, to these platforms that we can get ideas out there in front of an audience that otherwise would have just stayed in my journal, you know, and no one would have seen it. It doesn't mean that it's a good idea. It doesn't mean that it's interesting. But for me, it's at least like, you know, even if I can't afford to make that a neon right now, I can get the idea out there. Yeah, and so exactly. part of it is then building that like history where I have all of these kind of like, some of them are strands, some of them are like thought out and executed performances, but it's all there, you know, um, yeah. or at least most of it. And that's been like, I don't know, such an important like relief for me when I feel like, man, I can't, like there's this thing I want to do, but I can't do it. So I can get, I can get the idea out there for people to see. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, and and like the relationship of neon to an animated gif is like pretty perfect, you know. Yeah, totally. It's like that, I just, that like multi, like two or three fr- frames flashing. Yeah, you know, over I, and I over called it poor man's neon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, and it's such a great idea, you know, and. And now, like you know, there's a whole struggle to to like you know, well, loads of artists are doing like these animated gifs. It's like, how do we? you know, how do we deal with that? You know, how do, how do they get archived and displayed? And Yeah. The archive thing is interesting for me. I was, you know, I've, I've gotten into, I don't know, some level of verbal tiffs with people about, um, I just said verbal tiff. I, I don't really know. <laughs> I think it's just a tiff, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just a tiff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, something's not right about what I do. But, um, you know, but I've, I have different opinions about, just archiving stuff in general and, and digital archiving. And yeah. I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit maybe more reckless with that sort of thing and, and how that, I don't know, and, and how that manifests itself. Like I love link rot, for example. I kind of like the ephemeral nature of how you post something and it can get completely buried and lost, you know? I mean, yeah. I don't know how many posts I have on my Tumblr over the last few years, but it's like thousands. And yeah. I love, like, you can't really find anything in there unless you, like, get yeah. linked to it somewhere else, you know? And so, I don't know. But, but the, you know, the criti- from a critical standpoint, there's definitely, you know, a growing interest in the art world in, in terms yeah. of that format, yeah. which has been in the works for a little while now. But, um, yeah. yeah, which to some degree I'm interested in that conversation. And to another degree, it's like I'm just making what I want to make. Like, you yeah, know? <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, we, we all kind of saw what happened to digital archives with, what was it? Um, uh, was it Bitforms or something like that? The, oh yeah. They, they lost. So yeah. yeah they were, they like were everything. Having, um, uh, I think it was iBeam storage, which was, uh, yeah, in, yeah, that's right. I believe. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And I, I haven't followed up actually with what that, you know, but, but then again, it's like, I respect it's, it's tricky because I do, think that work that people are doing is important and should be preserved to some degree, but how it gets preserved, you know, and yeah. it's just I mean, a slippery slope because I wouldn't yeah. want anyone's, I guess what I'm saying is like, I wouldn't want anyone else's work to be destroyed. Like I don't, yeah, yeah. you know, I can't support that. And I feel like if people want to preserve their work that way, it should be. And that's for other people to decide. So then therefore it's kind of hypocritical of me to be like yeah. you know, <laughs> anti-conservation. But yeah. Um, but then there's, you know, yeah. some things that, that are, it's like part of of the whole medium that it's that it's a temporary, you know, time based thing. Yeah. You know, you don't think of like an animated GIF as as like necessarily like impermanent, but in a way, it it, it kind of is. You know, yeah, it can easily get deleted, disappear, get, and just get buried under like the total noise that's yeah that is Tumblr. You know? And I and I feel like I. I sometimes I relate it to like the documentation of performances from the early seventies um, and yeah. thinking about how this documentation literally could have just been a single photograph from something that happened, you know, like the yeah. video Kanji following piece and, and a few more photographs, but you know, something that's so almost like ephemeral that represents the idea. And then 
you know, the digital equivalent of that and what that, how that represents itself, you know, and I think there's something that's kind of, I don't know, it's really appealing to me that the actual thing might be lost, but there's this sort of remnant and like, or even like as simple as tracing it back to the, who the original author of something and the original content creator was for a GIF and sort of the, the history of it. And that sort of thing gets interesting to me and, and how you can't always figure out like where something came from. You know? I've heard it called the the democratic forest. You know, the idea that because everyone can okay. like publish now, that it sort of becomes really tough to find trees. And uh, yeah. and David Foster Wallace, I think he called it total noise. When yeah, talking about like creative writing majors coming up, you know, and yeah. getting produced. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's like, I guess that's part of the whole like art world machine is that it does. You know, it turns out a lot of people to, to enter into it, but it also like hashes everyone up, you know, yeah. regardless of, of the status. You know? Yeah. And uh, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, it was it was I mean, I mean, I guess like Damien Hirst even, you know, almost his career almost got shot down when, you know, Sachi like offed all of his collection all at once. And he had to run around to try to get funding to buy it all back. Yeah. Or he before he wouldn't be selling like any work at all. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I had a thought and it flew away. Crap. I hate sure it we'll, we'll come back to it probably. Yeah. Something about things. Oh, it was, um, yeah. Okay. Um, thinking about, you know, particularly in the online world and artists that are making work in, and, you know, I just finished this essay for uh, Hyperallergic about it, actually, so it's still, like, really fresh in my brain. But yeah. thinking about um, how, you know, to rise above the kind of noise, you know, to, to stand out in the, the forest, there are these tactics that different people are taking. And one of them is, you know, kind of – and it's, again, it could be attributed to an artistic voice. But, like, there are popular blogs out there that have very similar, you know, posts all the time. It's like you know pretty much what you're going to get. Yeah. Um, and th there's nothing inherently wrong in that, but I'm, I'm very – and I might like something. You know, I might yeah. like those artists or what they're posting or, or those content creators. Um, but I'm less likely to be surprised and I'm less yeah. likely to be challenged by that because there's a certain kind of um, – uh, almost like complacency if you know what might get a reaction out of people and what people yeah. might like or um, or reblog or whatever that might be. Yeah. And, I, and I feel like as someone that's found myself in this position where, um, you know, I have a lot of Tumblr followers um, that, you know, are a result of being listed in a section of the Tumblr website, which is for, you know, spotlight artists. And so yeah. it's it's a very bizarre thing where, to some degree, I feel like I just wandered into a room and then all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, these people showed up. And like, yeah. I don't really know why anyone's here. And I'm like, cool, I'm so glad you guys are here. Why are you here? You know, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, it's like, a, it's a little strange yeah. that way. Um, but I use it as a sort of like way to experiment with different types of content to see like what people yeah. respond to and what they don't. And yeah. sometimes I follow the things that no one responds to because I'm like, okay, I want to like go down this road yeah. because no one has like noticed this thing and that there's something in there. And then other times though, like I do find myself like, I know if I just post this photo of like the subway that I think is kind of cool, it's going to get about 20, you know, interactions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there's something really kind of perverse about that. Um, well, that, so, that's, that's another David Foster Wallace idea was that, um, he was trying to figure out sort of like low and high culture. And, and he came yeah. on the idea that like, that we're very diverse overall in our like highbrow and sophisticated tastes. You know, we hardly have any of that in common, you know, different directors, different authors, whatever, but we're all very common in our like base lowbrow taste. That's why pop music still sort of exists. You know? Yeah, totally. And then that line, and then thinking about the number of people, and then thinking about the types of, you know, blogs, for example, that might be the most reblogged or the most, and what those numbers mean. Yeah. You know, and, and the truth is, they really, on the one hand, they don't mean anything. But on the other hand, you know, 
it leads to a perception of of value. Yeah. And and again, that's such a strange concept for me because you know, it becomes almost like a weird uh, bargaining chip or it becomes this, it puts you in a position where, you know, of this perceived power, perceived level of taste making. And like, and there might be some truth in that, that, you yeah. know, um, I was actually having, I had a meeting earlier today about uh, this startup that I might be involved in in some capacity. And, you know, the person was sort of saying to, you know, more or less that I could be featured on this thing that would, be in somewhat of a tastemaker position, and it's just a very bizarre concept, you know. Like yeah. the, the whole thing is just kind of weird to me. And you know, some days it's like I don't care about what that role is for myself as a human being, as an artist, in relation to that. And then other days it's like, you know, none of this matters. <laughs> like, yeah. like really, you know, the the culture that we're creating, the the work that's being done, that that I or anyone else is sort of putting out there has so little value that it's like probably not worth it at all. And I know that's terrible to say, um, and I have a feeling that's really my own insecurities as like a as an artistic being and someone that's like sometimes very much like not able to process information. So like when yeah. when everything starts to crumble, then you know nothing makes any sense and it doesn't matter. You know, um, but that's very much like just about every artist you'll ever talk to. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> think know? so too. You know, it's yeah. like. And I think about the audience too on the internet, like it, it's sort of, again, it's a democratic forest, but if someone is interested, if like four people are interested in something, like there's a website about it. Oh, totally. And that's yeah, yeah. awesome. You know, yeah. like yeah. even if one person is interested and, and that's great that those things like have, have an outlet now, Yeah. you know, yeah. and, uh, and to me, that's like sort of the big democratic thing. It's like, you might have an audience for your work, but it might only be a handful of people, but you yeah. still have that audience, you know? Yeah. And um, the truth is, you know, it's impossible to say the value of that audience. Three people are not the same three people, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that also, that value is uh, relative to who you are and who they are, you know? Um, and, and you're then like level of putting any kind of importance on those three people at all, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, it's interesting. I like, um, I, I remember thinking about that right after my first kind of like performance. So um, it was this thing in Best Buy where I shot for 24 hours without oh, buying yeah. anything. Yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so I remember, um, you know, right after I did that, like suddenly all of these like New York institutions were following me. Like it was just a huge influx of like prestige, right? Yeah. And so um, – I shouldn't put that in quotes. I mean, they're prestigious inst institutions. And, but it kind of did a, a number on my head because, you know, I, here I was like just doing whatever I felt like I had to do, you know, like I was just sharing this stuff. Like, and then suddenly I have all these very different types of people following me that yeah. are in the room with me, you know, from MoMA to Joe Schmo artists, like, you know, whatever. And, yeah. um, or to like a bot, you know, that doesn't actually exist. And so, it was interesting during that time period and literally for a few years to think about how I speak to everyone all at once, <laughs> you know, like how do I speak to, you know, potentially this particular curator and then to find out that like, you know, occasionally I find out, oh my God, someone's following me and like I had no idea they were following me and like I probably should have been a little bit more like conscious about what I say, you know, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. and just like not even, you know, just to be more con uh, considerate or conscious or like aware and but then thinking about how that changes, like, well, does it matter if I'm talking to, you know, this fancy curator or to, like, my neighbor, you know? And should yeah. it? Yeah. And um, and I don't know. Like, I really yeah. don't know. And, and then on top of that, like, you know, there's a whole added layer of, like, you never really know when anyone's listening or not mm -hmm. um, until you say something really wrong and then they let you know that everyone yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know uh -huh. the internet is like the great bullshit detector these days yeah, yeah. Oh, no. um, and, and it's out. yeah it's amazing and um uh, yeah I, I remember when uh i think i'd been following you maybe for like a couple of months or something like that i just just like started to hear about what you were doing when you did the um and then you did the 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 best buy shopping thing and I remember reading that, um, reading stuff about that on like maybe Art Fag City or, or I don't even think Hyperallergic was around at that point. 
Yeah, they, but, they yeah. were just coming around. They were like a few months old, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it was hyperallergic then because because uh, I had I'd been reading that like from the start. Um, yeah. And, uh, and that was, uh, that was just such a funny piece to do. Cause like there was, there was that like one improv comedy troupe that had gone yeah. into Best Buy and like just pretended to sort of be Best Buy people. Yeah. Like, yeah. Wearing, like, I hadn't seen clothes. that one at the time, but that improv yeah. everywhere was a huge influence on that whole like part. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was, uh, and, and that was, that was kind of cool to see like something dumb essentially like improv everywhere do it and like actually make it into a smart sort of piece that has some implications yeah. you know yeah because yeah, that, that was great because it was, it was like worth it to be specifically best buy and to be yeah. like logging it on twitter and 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 stuff like that um yeah. and that it went for like a whole 24 hours shopping because yeah. yeah. no one no one does that you know people yeah. say they love shopping but they would they would kill anyone to shop for like that long Oh God, yeah. totally. And I think the other thing, you know, that, and in in the context of this particular, you know, platform for a learning experience, and you know, when you have a hit, you know, like because yeah. that that performance was a hit, you know, it did well, and you know, it's interesting to see how different people respond to that. Like artists, like you do something that that ends up being successful. How do you how do you evolve? Like, what do you do from there? You know, mm-hmm. and that's been an interesting, and if anything, I can share like, and it's more relevant to like either idea artists, like a performance artists, people that would like, you know, conceptual artists, basically. Yeah. That if you hit on something, what do you do if it does well? Like you just, I didn't yeah. assume that anything was going to happen out of that, you know? Yeah, like yeah. I literally went in with zero expectations other than like, I don't know, fuck, I'm going to go into, you know, Best Buy and tweet some shit. Um, and so when the response was what it was, it kind of was like, whoa, like, okay. But then, like, all right, let's do some other stuff that's, like, sort of similar, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, there's, think- that, there's that thing about uh, – I'm reading a, uh, a book. Um, it's Inside the White Cube, and it's, it's – Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, a collection of, of old essays, and he talks about, like, that particular gesture thing. And yeah. that, that, like, once you do one type of – once you do a gesture, you have to basically put that down. Yeah, you gotta kill the so gesture. timely, you know. Yeah. And then you, you know, maybe use like a gesture again, but a different sort of take on it, you know. And, and it's impossible to know like what's gonna gonna happen with that. Yeah, and I that really is one of those, I, like one yeah. of those practical things too about like when you have when you have a hit. It's like you know, I've like I've had friends like you know that'll that'll sort of get some notoriety, but they won't even have like a website. Yeah. Up or like a way to like sort of maintain those sort of like connections, you know, that you have with people. Yeah. And I think some of that is like quite honestly, physical proximity. So like in New York, I was able to kind of ride this thing and like, you know, I've been conscious about working the media when I can and how I can. And like, that's, those are conscious, like that's work, you know? Yeah, Yeah. Um, and, but also it's like literally just go to me, it goes back to like trusting. So it's like, all right, like you'll do work that looks a certain way, and like I really wish I had had that book after I did, you know, best on by would have been really beneficial to say like, okay, what does it look like if I completely put this down? But on the flip side, and it, it like really forced me to keep like looking at these things from different angles for a period of a couple of years that ended up leading to some really cool, you know, opportunities basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think now I'm in this position of, you know, I'm not trying to recreate the same gesture, but I'm also like. And I hit these moments where it's like I know I'm close. Like I just did something that like that touched a nerve. And and yeah. honestly, the Occupy Man thing was sort of like was was sort of similar. And in that I knew that I had to do it. I just like it happened. And the next thing I know, it ended up leading to um, to uh, an opportunity to speak at a TED Talk um, in in New York, which was like awesome. And like yeah. you know, so that's like something totally that happened, yeah. which was like pretty awesome. But yeah. then also really funny because. Ted doesn't pay their speakers. So I ended up talking about that a little bit in my talk because it was like, you know, yeah. here I am talking would, about money. You know, I would think that like the Ted stuff would be, you know, like five, like four, ten, four thousand, ten thousand dollar, depending on like. Yeah. But I mean, it, you know? yeah, this was like a, um, well, apparently across the whole thing, they don't pay any of their, even at the main event, but this was like an offshoot event. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really interesting to learn that and then to share it. And, you know, and so 
you know, that kind of awareness was really, it was very interesting to participate in that particular conference. And, yeah. you know, I know, I knew one of the organizers that put it on. He's a great guy. Like I have nothing but nice things to say about that, you know, particular person, but the sort of institution of idea generation as yeah. a business, you know, and as TED like inspiration, is, you know, <laughs> yeah. I met the guy that does quality. You know? I met the guy yeah. that does quality control for them in San Francisco wow. yeah. through yeah. through uh, this uh, this um, swing dancer that I went to go uh, and and hang out with, and uh, and that was her roommate, and and I was just like, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's. It's weird to see that from like a different angle, like the guy that just goes and makes sure the video is like recorded correctly and is yeah. going to play right and that it sort of relatively makes sense and is going to function. Yeah. Um, but and then I started thinking about what his job must be like. It must be like, you know, an overdose of inspiration all the time. Oh, my God. You know how like you well, could read you could read like productivity like tips you know, until you've procrastinated totally. for a year. If, he, you know? if you have his information, send it to me because I'd love to see what he thinks of my video. Because what I ended up doing was I blindfolded the audience and I didn't plan my talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I literally went up there like, all right, I gave everyone an envelope and I told them to, you know, once they all had an envelope, I was like, all right, take it out. And then I was like, if you put your blindfolds on now, we can start. And so I like blindfolded everyone and had no presentation and just yeah. literally like, talked about the process of like coming up with ideas and, and so anyway so I was really kind of like sticking it to the you know yeah. by just being like look you guys like let's yeah. what is it but mean that's, to have but that's idea? a really cool cool idea in terms in terms of too like them all being able to go back and look at it you know because like, <laughs> then it ends up feeding right back in it's like yeah. wait a second I'm I'm the sucker <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in any event so yeah that's hilarious so yeah but uh Cool. Any any questions? Like, actually, I need to get. Yeah, I was thinking that that we pretty much covered basically like everything <laughs> and more. <laughs> yeah. Been yeah. No, but this well, is this is really fun, and uh, yeah, we'll same. have to we'll have to check back sometime. I'll, I'll let you know like next time I'm headed up to New York and stuff. Yeah, and, please. Yeah, and, uh, that. and everything. But cool. uh, yeah, uh, I guess like the last thing is like, what what are you thinking? What are you thinking next? Like, what's the next project? Um, I think, you know, I did a rent piece recently, which was uh, a sale to, to come up with money for rent. So I'm thinking about doing... That's very uh, 1920s for sure. <laughs> exactly. I'm thinking about doing a, a bill piece. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Okay. So I've got a few proposals out to people um, for projects um, that are in various stages of development. Um I, I've been my my practice right now is very sort of like fragmented and splintered. I've been doing smaller things kind of here and there. One bigger project that I did recently, which I think is kind of where things are going with with my work, is more in the installation realm. So I did this piece in uh, Indianapolis uh, Museum of Contemporary Art um, in a show that was curated by Ben Valentine called "You Can Count on Me," mm -hmm. and basically it was a light bulb that was connected to this device so that any time someone tweeted the phrase, you can count on me, the light bulb turned either on or off. Um, and No, it turned on and then it turned off. And then it was sort of installed next to um, a, uh, a printout of a clicker, like a tally counter yeah. that you would like um, count heads, and then an actual uh, tally counter. And so um, this idea is sort of being related to the, the Kosuth uh, chair, 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 you know, picture of a chair, definition yeah. of chair, actual chair. Um, but doing that sort of for the social media virtual digital age where this light bulb represents people talking about it. There's an actual clicker and then there's an image of a clicker. Um, and so I have, I've had some other ideas in, in that same kind of realm of installation where it's things are happening in real time, but it's a physical representation of it. And it's kind of that came out of this project I did where for two weeks um, the internet – uh, controlled the bedroom light um, in my bedroom. So yeah. anytime I got mentioned <laughs> on Twitter, my light turned on. And um, it was really crazy to do that for two weeks. And I didn't tell anyone I was doing it. Yeah. Um, 
So the sort of projects like that that are kind of taking these things that are happening online and converting them into like real world experiences that affect me somehow, but also affect like kind of this our experience of it. Yeah. That sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. It's a really yeah. long winded answer. I haven't quite gotten no, to, like no, no. points. <laughs> no, I mean the, the whatever, but but no, that that sounds great. I mean yeah. that sort of like that sort of installation temporal real time thing, you know, it's you know, along with the whole social social thing and sort of like uh collectively not even conscious, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. And that that's people really participating cool. without even realizing that they're participating yeah. in this thing that's happening but has a real world effect. Like it, just yeah, really yeah. briefly, I thought about doing one where something happens, I haven't figured it out, but basically it shocks me, you know. So it's like a physical yeah. shock that happens on my body when something happens on my, you know, that people are unaware of. So there's something and it's still like it, like we were talking about earlier, it's like I know I'm close, I'm like not quite there. I'm like it's in there and I just gotta like pull it out and I yeah. and so so anyway, so we'll see kind of where it goes, but yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's pretty fascinating. I'm I'm excited to see like how that how that ends up. Thanks, man. Yeah. 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 I appreciate cool. it. Awesome. All right, well, well, yeah, it's been such a yeah. pleasure chatting with you and yeah. And you kids keep learning out <laughs> there and <in> learn land. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. good. Thanks for, thanks for your time. I'll let you go. Oh, dude, my pleasure, man. Cheers. Yeah. Take care. You too.